I'm really honored to be part of this panel and to come after this really fascinating presentation. And I'm really glad to have this opportunity to present an early version of this work examining the connection between types of wartime local governance and the stability of post-war governments. Um, so, of course, quite a lot of work has already been done on the determinant of civil war recurrence and the obstacles that may prevent post-war government from achieving stability. And so this existing argument emphasizes the importance of the way in which a conflict, or at least his, its first phase, has ended. Um, they suggest that dur durable peace is more likely after one side in the war achieves a clear victory because having a military dominant victor deters further challenge. And in contrast, um, settlement lead to a more fragile peace because even if the parties agree to the terms that have been negotiated, they have no guarantee that these terms will be enforced. And so these are really important uh, mechanism and we do have evidence uh, that civil war recurrence is less likely after a conflict that ended with a victory of one side. But at the same time, there are important patterns of variation that this mechanism leave um, unexplained. So, um, not all uh, victory lead to a stable peace and not all settlement fail. And uh, there is value in understanding this um, unexplained pattern. More specifically, it's important to better identify the threats that post-war government face, even when they were formed by victors. And um, it's also important to better identify some of the resources that have allowed some of the governments that emerged out of settlement to achieve stability. Um, so maybe one way to make progress in this area it is to look more closely at the specific processes um, through which the post-war post order can unravel. And so I... Um, I focus on three mechanisms of processes. So the first is a process of fragmentation. So it can be the fragmentation of the ruling um, coalition or some of its constitutive entities, but it can also be the fragmentation of the insurgent movement um, with whom the government uh, is negotiating. The second mechanism that can threaten post-war stability is incomplete uh, or failed demobilization. So demo, uh, demobilization program or efforts, whether they are like structured and supporting by international agencies or not, are notoriously hard to implement. And flawed implementation often means that demobilization is not thorough enough to allow the government to provide security. Um, and a third mechanism that can undermine stabilization is post-war government's reliance and dependence on local power broker. So the task that post-war government face is that they must rebuild and stabilize the country, but often without the benefit of strong institution. And so in this situation, they often form alliances uh, with different type of local uh, power broker who have local, uh, local capacity for social control. But these alliances are fragile and costly, and therefore they limit the possibilities for genuine recovery and for durable peace. Uh, so um, I'll talk more about the mechanism when I get to the case study, but I wanted to get to, um, to my core argument, which is that um, uh, um, which is that the vulnerability of post-conflict government to these three mechanisms, so mechanism, uh, fragmentation, failed demobilization, and dependence on local power broker, depends at least in part on how dominant armed group in the conflict have approached um, local power structure during the war. So what I mean by local power structure are the various forms of community level organization that shape people's everyday behavior and interaction, as well as local political processes. And so we can make a broad distinction between some armed groups that have established themselves by co-opting local power structure. So examples of this would be the Tuareg rebellion in Niger and Mali, which mobilized in part around existing confederation. And another example would be the Shan State Army in Myanmar, which capitalized on um, traditional local ruling dynasties. Um, the SPLM in South Sudan, which had plans to establish a whole different new administrative structure, but in practice uh, ended up often co-opting um, existing traditional chiefs. And in the other category, you have other armed groups that have mostly displaced and transformed local power structure. 
including various groups from the Viet Minh that set up People's Revolutionary Committee in villages throughout northern and central Vietnam, or in Afghanistan, the Taliban who started to set up shadow, uh, shadow governments um, in the early 2000s. So of course, this is a, 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 an, an oversimplification and there's a lot of really important work that has been done that shows variation um, in how rebel group approach local power structure, both uh, across the territory they control and also over time throughout the course of the conflict. So yeah, so this doesn't capture this really important within case variation, but still we can say that there are differences in rebel groups' um, dominant and aspirational strategy. And so my main point is that it is harder for a post-war government to achieve stability after conflict in which dominant actors adopted strategies of transform um, of co cooperation of cooptation sorry rather than transformation um, why because of there are more severe and more misaligned incentives within organization that have adopted strategies of cooptation so um, when rebel groups have built themselves and grown by co-opting local power structure, they, re they remain quite dependent on the local elite who control the structure. Um, and so the top leadership of the group cannot easily, in case of internal conflict, the top of leadership cannot easily replace this local elite. Um, if, uh, let's say, like I'm going to talk about the case of Somalia, like a clan leader wants to leave the armed group, he will take his community and his faction um, with him. So these local elites maintain this kind of exit option, which means that um, there are greater risk of fragmentation both during and after the war. Um, second, to preserve their status, these local elites are likely to resist uh, genuine demobilization. So for an armed group to disarm, it's not enough for its top leadership to agree to um, demobilization, an important condition of successful demobilization, uh, demobilization is the presence of an institutionalized integrated chain of command that is committed to the effort and that is recognized as legitimate by the fighters. And so in organizations in organization that grew through cooptation, these conditions are less likely or unlikely to be present. Um, Finally, when armed group adopts strategies of cooptation, it's then difficult for post-war government to consolidate power and rule autonomously. This is because the elites that have been co-opted become strong men that can be effective rival to the post-war government. And um, when on the contrary, armed group have used strategy of transformation, they've already replaced strong men by strong organizations that they can then, um, that can be then key levers that allow them to rule autonomously. Um, so that's the theory of the mechanism, that the, the degree to which post-war governments are vulnerable to fragmentation, stalled demobilization, or lack autonomy depends in part on the extent to which armed groups um, during the war have co-opted rather than transformed local power structure. So how can we look at this uh, empirically? So one way to do this, um, and this is still a work in progress. Oh, um, sorry, I didn't manage the <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> 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 um, so um, I have this uh, data set that looks at uh, that has a range of viable capt capturing ways in which um, group have approached local power structure, um, and so I've documented both practice in which they have transformed this structure by creating new institutions, by redistributing land and assets, by empowering disempowered, disempowered group, and practices through which they have co-opted. And so the plan is to look at whether we see some kind of connection between these wartime practices and the likelihood of civil war recurrence. But for today, um, I want to um, uh, present evidence from a comparison between two cases that ended similarly with a victory of the insurgents, and yet they had, the post-war government had extremely different uh, trajectory. So in both uh, Ethiopia and Somalia, insurgent groups overthrew the incumbent regime in 1991. And so in Ethiopia, um, a coalition of rebel groups led by the uh, Tigray People Liberation Front overthrew the regime of the Derg. In Somalia, uh, different rebel groups, um, including the United Somali Congress and the Somali National Movements, but there were more groups overthrew the regime of Siad Barre. 
Um, so in Ethiopia, um, the, the rebel coalition that came to power um, stayed in power from 1991 until 2018, um, and it's been um, like it, it, it's been a period of like severely constrained political right for the country, but also a period in which the government was able to enact successful reform leading to lower poverty and better access to basic services. And throughout this period, there were like localized conflict and mass protests, but not, none of this pro uh, conflict became an existential threat to the government. In Somalia. Um, the level of violence did not really decline after the fall of the previous regime, even after the UN sent a mission to enforce the ceasefire, and the transition government was not formed until 2000. It remained too divided to agree on the path forward. It was replaced by, the, by a new transition federal government, which was not really more successful at uh, restoring um, stability. And if we zoom in at uh, this period that immediately follows the war, uh, we see the role of the three processes I mentioned earlier, so fragmentation, incomplete demobilization, and dependence on uh, local power brokers. Um, so in Ethiopia, the, the group that the TPLF, the group that dominated the ruling coalition, continued to experience severe internal crisis after the war, just as that during the war, but this in severe internal crisis did not lead to a splintering, um, in part because of its rules and procedures, but most importantly, because no member of the top leadership had a personal fol um, following, he was able to like, withstand the crisis without splittering. Um, and we see something completely different in Somalia. Uh, the two main groups, so the uh, USC and SNM, both disintegrated. Somalia went through a long period of factional war. Um, so we can take the example of the um, United Somali Congress, there were two factions that fought until 1998, and even when um, they started to negotiate, that triggered, triggered a new splintering. Um, I'm, I'm probably not going to have time to go through all the mechanisms, but I wanted to say something about um, demobilization. So the TPLF was able to like demobilize a lot of the insurgent troops, and those uh, troops that were not demobilized were integrated in the national army, and they even arrived at a situation where the insurgent troops agreed to, um, to fight under the leadership of national army officers, meaning of the officers of the army they had just been fighting a few years earlier. Um, in Somalia, the insurgents were like, unable to demobilize their, their fighter. Um, there are many examples, but um, even in like, Somaliland, which is now viewed as this part of, of Somalia that achieved a kind of like, order or stability, um, they were like, there was um, so little control of the like, insurgent faction that they ended up um, abusing their own clan or the clan they were, they were coming from. Um, so two very different paths, and the question is, do we have evidence of a connection or continuity to um, wartime mode of local governance? Um, and, large, and largely, uh, we do. So I want to start by saying a few words about the TPLF strategy of um, local engagement. So the TPLF um, established its support, its support base by, by dismantling the existing village-level political structure, replacing them with new popular councils, and then it used this council to enact a, radi a very radi a radical uh, land reform program, like redistributing land, which is one of the most uh, uh, consequential and radical reform you can enact in an agrarian society. And so this reform helped the TPLF build a robust support base. It helps the organization recruit during the war, but it also helped with demobilization because then there was plots or land that the fighters could go back to after the war. Um, and in Somalia, the mobilization process was very different. Initially, there were efforts to establish each of these organizations as multi-clan organization that would, have, that would be based on a shared um, political platform rather than on clan identity. But these attempts mostly failed, and they failed for a range of reasons. Um, some of them was because the government strategy was to arm a clan faction against each other. But also, it failed because um, once they transitioned from um, mobilization to actually like taking arm against the government, it was they assessed that it was more efficient to build like combat units around uh, um, clan lines than to try and like recombine uh, the units they had. 
Yeah, so thank you, Sam. So that's, that, those were the main points I wanted to touch on. And to conclude, I want to say briefly a few words about some of the theoretical and practical implication um, of the distinction I was making. So one theoretical question that it might be relevant for is always this, there's this question of whether new wars are different from previous wars in that they contribute to the erosion of state institution rather than state building. Maybe that distinction can help us um, look differently at the question of under what conditions do, work, do wars make the state, and one of these conditions may be that the dominant actors have initiated political process that undermine rival of the state. And uh, finally, there's also this argument that has been made sometimes that foreign intervention prevents a return to stability by preventing the emergence of a clear victor. But as we've seen, um, insurgent can defeat the adversary without having the capabilities of achieving a secure peace. And so, um, yeah, I'll stop here. Uh, thank you very much.